or you place yourself in time, the Navishin society, or act up, that doesn't bring with it anything like self-acceptance overnight. For me, the process, even in my advanced years, remains ongoing. Liberation is something that I'm certain will never be complete. On a daily basis, I still have to grapple with a lot of what was done to me more than 50 years ago. I have to grapple with the scars, the deep, permanent scars that remain." Unquote. Thus we arrive at the more developed notion of a second stage, or phase, of gay identity formation after its solid establishment, in which that clarified identity now redemptively comes to better terms with its psychological underpinnings in the ongoing pursuit of enhanced personal fulfillment as successfully homosexual. Places inside that are still wounded, thwarted, distorted, and so on by formative or present experiences of bigotry and other malignant forces must be effectively identified and reparatively addressed to further secure, empower, enrich, and extend the meaning and value of estimable homosexual personhood, not only to rescue ourselves determinationally from malevolent social victimization, but even more importantly, to thereby advance the beauty and brightness of being valuably same-sex loving as an encouraging beacon of hope for the eventual achievement of human self-realization overall. Therefore, a second stage in gay identity formation concerns the efficacious development of psychological awareness, the capacity to see and engage the interiorly known world of experienced images and feelings in progressive terms of the salient developmental issues such wise being presented for that gay person, particularly those issues implicating how the cognizant self, the ego, feels about itself. To support this novel functional direction and circumstantiate the resulting comprehension to be attained homosexually in committedly following out its better actualization is the productive purpose of ideologically distinguishing a usable gay psychology and indeed is the propulsive reason for the existence of the Institute for Contemporary Uranian Psychoanalysis altogether. Certainly, because same-sex loving means ongoing. Liberation is something that I'm certain will never be complete. On a daily basis, I still have to grapple with a lot of what was done to me more than 50 years ago. I have to grapple with the scars, the deep, permanent scars that remain." Unquote. Thus we arrive at the more developed notion of a second stage, or phase, of gay identity formation after its solid establishment, in which that clarified identity now redemptively comes to better terms with its psychological underpinnings in the ongoing pursuit of enhanced personal fulfillment as successfully homosexual. Places inside that are still wounded, thwarted, distorted, and so on by formative or present experiences of bigotry and other malignant forces must be effectively identified and reparatively addressed to further secure, empower, enrich, and extend the meaning and value of estimable homosexual personhood not only to rescue ourselves determinationally from malevolent social victimization, but even more importantly, to thereby advance the beauty and brightness of being valuably same-sex loving as an encouraging beacon of hope for the eventual achievement of human self-realization overall. Therefore, 
A second stage in gay identity formation concerns the efficacious development of psychological awareness, the capacity to see and engage the interiorly known world of experienced images and feelings in progressive terms of the salient developmental issues such wise being presented for that gay person particularly those issues implicating how the cognizant self, the ego, feels about itself. To support this novel functional direction and circumstantiate the resulting comprehension to be attained homosexually in committedly following out its better actualization is the productive purpose of ideologically distinguishing a usable gay psychology and indeed is the propulsive reason for the existence of the Institute for Contemporary Uranian Psychoanalysis altogether. Certainly, because same-sex loving peoples insistently do, and will continue to show, an abiding interest in existing and consolidating themselves as such, and because doing so embodies such a powerfully progressive impulse of broad social and political relevance, the necessity to helpfully grasp homosexual personality development and lifetime functioning in a wide range of pertinent contexts will only suitably grow. And while there are established associations of LGBT psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, etc., and the publication of various books in this topical area, even graduate training programs in gay affirmative psychology, there has never been a scholarly and professional center until now rigorously dedicated to homosexual psychological functioning and wholesome individuation. A serious research and training facility for more effectually advancing the better theoretical and practical comprehension of what aptly could be called gay-centered psychology by which I mean a respectful attempt to systematically apprehend and usefully facilitate same-sex loving subjectivity healthily. The current times require pioneering such an introvert formulational direction due to the pressing need for better psychological awakening in society generally and in gay and lesbian people particularly by, quote, better psychological awakening, unquote, I mean that which results from a more conscious encounter with oneself as a psychological being, as an entity consisting of existential subjectivity in its immediacy. That is, the mental functioning and experience of psychic life the world of private thoughts, images, feelings, sensations, associations, themes, layers, and mysteries in relation to itself, as it is or can be aware of itself, feeling itself, and so on. I say, as it can be experienced, in addition to how it is presently doing so, to suggest a non-static quality and growthful potentiality to self-awakening psychological existence that allow for the most interesting manifestation of possibilities. My turn here is with the development of humanity as a psychological species. From this point of view, Physical life has emerged from the mud on Earth through evolving the spinal cord and then the brain in order to bring about the presence and evolution of electrically based subjective life, finally culminating in that non-material existence successfully becoming conscious of and in itself. It is with the challenge of this latter step that humanity finds itself struggling mightily today. Rather than gracefully embracing such a momentous historical opportunity, of course, most people seem quite oblivious to the remarkable opening auspiciously being epically offered, if they are not downright hostile to its improved realistic recognition. 
Yet, the accumulating evolutionary pressure to accountably take up the veritable fact of being psychological only increases reciprocally as it is denied irresponsibly. And this stalemating dilemma has led inevitably to the strange waste and distracted stagnation presently characterizing such extrovertedly biased post-industrial societies as the United States of America. An earlier age might have described this kind of deep-rooted social malaise in traditional religious terms, or perhaps philosophically, just as current exteriorizing attitudes might locate it sociologically, economically, or in history, if it is even recognized at all. But ever since Sigmund Freud began to systematically notice how people seem so much to be privately motivated consistently by irrational unconscious forces of usually unfortunate consequence, it is, in my estimation, more relevant to frame the matters under our consideration here as, quote, psychological, unquote, in the sense that Freud and his ideological successors have been broadly concerned with. The world of human subjectivity seen in terms of psychodynamic relations. This intellectual perspective, within which I would include formulational offshoots, such as humanistic and cognitive behavioral approaches, has arisen and persisted because of humanity's surging need for a better specifying theory and practice of evolutionary mental enhancement than offered by previous or presently competing traditions. One that is, first of all, more effectively able to identify and address the existential problem of psychological responsibility in the context of personal authenticity. That is, the ethical necessity entailed in sincere individual becoming to properly take ownership more consciously of one's own, quote, psychological business, unquote, one's inner emotional and functional issues, rather than be otherwise unconsciously dominated by them through psychological defensive mechanisms, such as projection, dissociation, acting out, collusion, and so on, automatic mechanisms that lawlessly enable and misbegottenly perpetuate horrific forms of symbolic and literal individual and collective violence, such as child abuse, murder, group scapegoating, and totalitarianism. It is this most intimate relationship between a person and her or his own personal psychology, it seems to me, that is at the historic crux of humanity's fate and freedom today. <clears throat> In that liberatory self-realization inevitably leads to facing internally oppressive forces manifested in one's charged self-relations, so as to rightfully reach a rejuvenated degree of authentic self-actualizational empowerment, legitimate existential becoming, and ultimate valuational fulfillment unprecedented in finally reparatively addressing humanity's perpetually destructive infantilism. Indeed, it seems to me that through the better pursuit of personal psychological responsibility, a psychoanalytic worldview provides for a second crucial arena of more accurate theory and practice in the ionic shift of fundamental values now historically underway. One of perhaps even greater importance than that of subjective ownership itself, one concerned with the pursuit of ultimate spiritual matters and essential transcendental meaning 